Seven years had passed since Luther's visit to Rome. In that time, Pope Julius II had died. He was succeeded by Leo X. And Leo was a man devoted to the pleasures of the flesh. At his dinner parties, he would regularly serve a great cake from which would leap little naked boys. Within two years of sumptuous festivals and wild boar hunts, Leo had emptied the papal treasuries. He was forced to halt work on the church's greatest extravagance yet, the glorious Basilica of St. Peter's. It's one of the greatest building schemes in European history, and all the great artists and sculptors and architects of the Italian Renaissance, without exception, took part in this scheme. It just sucked in money as building projects do suck in money. Leo was unconcerned. To refill his treasuries, he turned to one of the church's most proven methods for raising money. Selling indulgences, charging the faithful for entry into heaven. This indulgence was basically a piece of paper sold for a, a very appropriate sum of money, incidentally adjusted to your means, which promised to pay the bearer on demand forgiveness of sins. Leo's indulgence had a number of unique benefits. You could buy one not just for yourself, but also for your dead relatives. And it pardoned an astonishing array of sins. It was said that it would even forgive sexual intercourse with the Virgin Mary, had that been possible. Here was salvation in exchange for a sum. The sums of money trying to be raised in the 1517 indulgence are very, very large, and we're talking tens of thousands of gulden. Uh, we're, we're talking in, in modern money, many millions. Leo made careful preparations for the issuing of his new indulgence. He brought in a Dominican friar called Johann Tetzel to handle the sales and PR. He had chosen well. Tetzel was a marvelous advertising executive who had a wonderful line in, in, in promotional uh, jingles and uh, slogans. He almost invented the advertising jingle, you see. He would say, when the coin in his coffer rings, then the soul heavenward wings. See, you can actually see the soul uh, uh, um, <laughs> escalating to heaven from purgatory. Leo waited for his empty coffers to fill with the donations of the faithful. Tetzel's main market for selling the new indulgence was Germany. And the people of Wittenberg quickly heard about the bargain deal that the church was offering on redemption. Luther found that many of his congregation had turned away from his sermons and were rushing to spend their hard-earned money on Tetzel's offer. But for Luther, his moment of revelation had left him with one simple message. Salvation was a gift from God, a gift received through faith. And that meant the church had no right to sell redemption. This is a pastoral issue for him. His own parishioners are bringing to him letters saying that because they purchase an indulgence, they do not have to confess to him, and that they are showing a, a assurance that they're saved, uh, which Luther thinks is totally an illusion, and that they're likely to be damned as a result of this. And so for him, this is a very serious matter. He's angry because this, is, this really counts. P people's lives are at stake. If they get this wrong, they can go to hell. This monk, who had once been the church's most devoted servant, now turned on the institution to which he had vowed his life. 
On the evening of the 31st of October, 1517, Luther sat down and penned a furious litany of criticism. 95 stinging bullet points, or theses, that lashed into the Pope and the trade in indulgences. Then he nailed them to the door of Wittenberg's castle church. was a blistering attack on the greatest power of the day. God's blessing is freely available without the keys of the Pope. Indulgences are truly pernicious. They induce complacency and imperil salvation. The Pope is richer than Croesus. He would do better to sell St. Peter's and give the money to the poor people. In sum, what the 95 Theses are saying is where are the limits of papal power? The first one, I think, opened the agenda very well indeed because it says that the route to repentance, to forgiveness, is much more arduous than the one sketched out in indulgences. Indulgences say easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Indulgences say that forgiveness is facile. What Christ says, and Luther quotes him, is that Repentance, forgiveness lies in repentance. Forgiveness lies in repentance. It's more difficult. So they are really calling into question, I think, um, papal power. This is an issue at the heart of faith. It has to be brought out into the open. It is summoning other minds and those who would dare defend these practices or abuses to come out and to show their proof. Of course, for him, scripture is the basis for discussion, scripture and clear reason. There is still much discussion of how much trouble Luther actually wanted to cause. It was standard practice to pin texts for academic discussion to the church door. They weren't intended to be published, they're in Latin, they're technical, they're difficult to understand in places, but at the same time, it's just a little bit difficult reading the style of the 95 Theses and the fact that Luther is thinking so hard and feeling so strongly to imagine that he just wanted this to be nothing more than a private conversation with an ecclesiastical high up. It's hard not to think that he had the, at least the threat of going public in his mind. In the end, other people did it for him. Luther was about to become one of the first top-selling authors in history. Less than 70 years before, another German, Gutenberg, had perfected the world's first printing press. Already, printers were running off countless books and pamphlets, even Leo's indulgences. And now Luther's outspoken work was copied down and set for printing. The theses would spread like wildfire across Germany, setting Luther and all Europe on a path no one could have anticipated. Not very hidden within them is the potential to undo the authority of the Pope. The Pope himself was a sponsor of indulgences, including their sale. This was not done without his approval. And what right had some upstart friar to call them into question? Luther really didn't anticipate the consternation that this would arouse at the very highest level.
But it was not for nothing that the Catholic Church had held power for over a thousand years. It had a name for people like Luther. They were heretics. And the penalty for heresy was death. The stage had been set for the church's greatest conflict in its history. A battle between the most powerful institution on earth and one solitary monk. 